So whenever the three of us get sick of boring, depressing news stories, which is pretty much every week now, uh, we're known to go off on our own. And it seems like a lot of the shows that we do off of politics have to do with space because space is cool. We've talked a lot about SpaceX. And I want to talk about SpaceX today, but it's not because they've got a new really cool piece of equipment. They've got a, a new really cool piece of equipment, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about what I haven't seen in forever and ever and ever. And that is a combination of vision and and will. This is what the country used to be made of. And uh, it looks like we might be making a comeback. Um, Steve, uh, I saw a video. I, I've been a following SpaceX, obviously. I saw a video for this launch complex. Uh, it's not just a launch complex, it's a landing complex. They're calling it Mechazilla. And uh, <laughs> it's a little short for Mechagodzilla. But basically what happens is now they can land the, these rockets pretty much anywhere they want to, and they're not even going to put legs on them anymore. They're going to catch them by the launch tower. I thought, eh, it seems a little flamboyant, but what the heck? I'm, you know, okay, sure. Save weight maybe on the landing gear. No, no, no. You do save weight on the landing gear, but that's not what it's all about. The way SpaceX is structuring the future, they plan to capture in these in the claws of this launch pad. The launch pad will recover the booster and then it will recover the actual um Starship part, the upper stage, after it comes back from orbit, and it will stack them and fuel them. And Elon Musk says he thinks he can turn a starship around in, is it a month? No, it's not a month. A day? No. He thinks he can fly three starship flights a day. A day. And I thought, come on now, come on. You know, really. Uh, you mentioned the backstage show. We heard that we could get a shuttle flight every two weeks. But I mean, one, uh, three flights a day, one flight a day is insane. Maybe one a week. But then I, then I uh, took a look at it and, 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 uh, Elon Musk is determined to put a, a sustainable city on Mars by 2050. And he is determined it will take a certain number of launches in order to accomplish this. Now, the, the uh, Starship and the, and the heavy booster is a big rocket, a big rocket. And I thought, well, Mars City, that what's that, maybe five, six, I don't know, two, three hundred launches, something like that to get there. No, it's not two or three hundred launches. It's not two or three thousand launches. It's 50 thousand launches to get this city on Mars and 50,000. And then I realized, man, you're going to have to turn that starship around like three times a day. Uh, you're going to have to turn it around in an hour. Here's the thing, Steve. Um, when, when Lincoln was looking for a, a general, he, Lincoln looked at Believe me, there's a point to this. Lincoln looked at a catastrophe at Fredericksburg. It was just a, a, an unbelievable, unmitigated catastrophe for the Union. Big Southern victory. And, and Lincoln looked at those numbers and said, you know, if we have nothing but a string of Fredericksburg, we'll win this war in, in, in a year because we've got the resources and they don't. And so Shelby Foote said Lincoln spent his time trying to find a general who could face the arithmetic. That was the term he used face the arithmetic. We're going to have to kill so many people in order to get this done. And I need a general who's willing to do that. That's what strikes me about what I see with Mechazilla and Elon Musk, uh, Steve. He's a guy who seems willing to face the arithmetic of 50,000 launches. And then, okay, well, if that's what we have to do. Let's do it. How, how, how do we do this audacious thing? Uh, this country was built on that. This country was built on that question. How do we do this audacious thing? And it didn't matter what this was. It changed from time to time, from context to context. But that's how this country was formed, and that's how it was built. That's what made it great right from the start, even when it was just, you know, three or four million farmers and merchants hugging the East Coast. Um, and it's come back to us in the form of a slightly demented South African dude. I love this. You know, uh, Musk is, I think, a year or two younger than I am. I'm 52. I think he's 50 or 51 now. And wow, he's done a lot more than I ever have in a shorter amount of time. Good on you. But I think my favorite thing about Musk is that it's like one of my fellow Gen X nerds uh, growing up with all these sci-fi dreams in the 70s and 80s made it big and is making it happen. I know if it had been somehow me, it was never going to be me. But if it had been somehow me that started SpaceX, yes, I would have named my rocket after the Millennium Falcon. Yes, I would name my launch and catch facility Mechazilla. Um, there's that 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 
nerdy sense of whim- whimsy that he brings to everything. And it's a good I, point. It, and it, it's it that is to me almost as inspiring as uh, as what he's attempting with Mars. Um, what I love though is. I actually wonder if Mars is the right thing to do. Um, uh, the smarter vision might be the one Jeff Bezos has to build the, uh, 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 what do they call the cylinders? Uh, O'Neill cylinders? The space habitats. Uh, uh-huh. um, yeah, you put the yeah. ro- rotating cylinders at a Lagrange yeah, yeah, yeah. point and-, and the, uh, uh, What are they? Uh, it'll come to me. Yeah, anyway, go ahead. I, yes, I want to say O'Neill cylinders, but I, I, I'm not sure that's right. Uh, and Bezos may have the right vision, but he lacks the vision to make it happen. Um, you know, he's, Blue Origin's been around for 20 years. They're still jerking themselves around. They can't even get in, get into orbit. Um, Musk is thinking, how do I get 50,000 rockets to Mars? And this is amazing. Just amazing if he can pull this off. You mentioned the space shuttle. When they were selling the shuttle back in the 70s, they told us it was going to be a two-week turnaround time from uh, from landing the shuttle to getting it ready to uh, to launch again. And this was going to change, just completely change the launch industry and make it affordable. Needless to say, that never happened. I think three launches a year for, for a single shuttle was a, was a really big year, really, really pushing it. So they could do it in like three or four months. Um, if Musk can do this, if he can get a turnaround time to a day, he'll he'll get his fifty thousand launches. Not only that, the uh, the Starship is fairly inexpensive to build. He's building it out of stainless steel, easy easy enough to make. He's turning it into an assembly line process again. This is what we're talking about with the vision, Bill. Previously, every big rocket was this sort of boutique, handmade, one use yep. gem of a of a rocket. Now Musk is turning that. He's he's a combination of uh, of uh, Edison, Ford, and P.T. Barnum, and boy, this country needs that right now. Tell you what, um, Scott. You know. Uh, if anybody else had said this, I would have said, okay, sure. You know. Yeah. But but I, I believe he'll do it. And the reason I believe I'll do it, and we've talked about this several times on this show before, as I mentioned in the introduction. The reason that Musk is successful is because he's willing to blow up rockets. And I don't mean blow them up like launch them into space. I mean, he's willing to explode things because he understands this fundamental engineering principle. And that is we don't know what we don't know until we know it. And there is no way around this process. You look at people like Virgin Galactic, who's oh, we're not going to have any any fatalities, not going to have any mechanical failures. It doesn't work that way. And that's why it doesn't work for for Virgin Galactic or for um, Blue Origin. Bezos has had a lot more money than Musk for a lot longer than Musk has. And he hasn't done anything with it because it's a hobby for him. Musk is going to Mars, by God. He's going. And he is facing the arithmetic. And and it's his willingness to fail, Scott, that has me utterly convinced that he's going to succeed. You know, the amazing thing about it is that when you hear stuff like 50,000 launches and going to Mars and building a city there, it just all sounds so impossible. Um, But, you know, like 120 years ago, um, with the exception of a few uh, balloon observationists, (laughs) there was no human being floating above the surface of the Earth unless he was committing suicide, and that didn't last very long. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and now, at any given moment, there's something like 9,000 planes in the air and possibly around 1.2 million people now floating above the surface of the planet (laughs) at any given time, okay? Sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, But if you had said this, even to the Wright brothers, they would have laughed you out of the place. (laughs) As out of their bicycle shop. as crazy. It was like, oh yeah, you know, someday there are going to be 1.2 million people simultaneously floating above the surface of the earth at like 500 miles per hour. <laughs> I don't think so. So what I love about all of this, Bill, is you hinted at this at our backstage uh, episode, which by the way, only members can see at BillWhittle.com. Um, but the future today is better than the future was when I was a kid. And we have waited for decades for there to be a better future than there was when we were kids. Because I remember reading those books in the school library with these sleek, 
cars and sleek spacecraft and all this awesome stuff that we were going to be able to see and do. And at that time, as decades went by, I thought, well, when do I get my jetpack? As you've said before, you know, it's like, and now my spandex jacket, we finally met the guy who read those books in elementary school with the watercolor paintings in them and believed it and decided to do something about it. Um, and he's not the only one. I mean, there are others out there who are who are attempting spectacular acts too. He's just been extraordinarily effective at doing it. So I, I just think this is, this is fantastic. I think people need to have a vision like this. It pulls us all out of our quotidian existences and says, hey, there's, it, it's possible. Your life could be better than it is. You could be the guy who's dreaming of going to Mars or at least maybe quitting that awful job of yours and starting a new business. One of the Apollo astronauts, when asked about how we got to the moon in, in the 1960s and early 70s, said that the Apollo program reached 50 years into the future and managed to pull something back hmm. and, and, and ride it. And I think that's absolutely right. You talk to young people today and they say, well, how could you have gone to the moon in the 60s? Because you didn't have computers. You didn't have all these other things that we've got now. Well, we've got them now. Now we have computers that can land a rocket on its own exhaust plume. And that's that's groovy. But what has been missing, <laughs> what has been missing has been the will. It's never been the technology. Yes. It's been the will. It's always been the will and the vision. And the vision got smaller and smaller and smaller the older I got. And the will is weaker and weaker. Elon Musk is doing this and he is swimming upstream against a culture that 50 years ago would have been pushing him on. Now he's fighting against this culture of, well, it's bad for the environment. It, well, you know what? You can take your environment. We're taking our environment to Mars. You can complain about it on Mars. <laughs> we'll make our own environment. <laughs> Damn right. Um, and and so he, he is he's he's got the vision and he's got the willpower to actually do it. And he's got the confidence to fail. All of these are the keys to success. The most single influential moment in my life, I would have to say, was when I was five or six years old and I went to the uh, to the Futurama display at the uh, World's Fair in New York in 1963 or four. And you get on this moving car thing like at Disneyland, although this was the first one ever. We get in this thing, it's moving. Yes, it's a chair that's moving. Oh my God, there's speakers in the back. Oh my God. And and I, what I remember about this as a five-year-old is that we would go down and you heard this voice, this kind of his voice, and, and you'd hear things like, by 1980, we will have sea, underwater cities will spot the, the bottom of the ocean. will be, And then by 1990, we'll have a moon thing and so on. And we'll be pumping in water from the deserts. We use nuclear power to pump water from the ocean, desalinate it, and, and, and grow cotton in Arizona. And I believed it. And, and the people who made it believed it. And we were able to do it and we're able to do it today. We can do it today. It's never been about the technology or the engineering ever, ever. It's always been about the will and the vision. And when I saw this man is actually constructing the hardware to fly 50,000 missions to Mars three a day, I thought to myself, wow, I guess he's going to do it. Now, uh, one final thing as a close. I got to tell you, I, I I just look at the Starship and I just think that that's not a real spaceship. It can't possibly be a real spaceship. And the reason it can't be a real spaceship is because it looks so much like what the people who thought that the future would look like yes. thought the future would look like. No, no, no. The future's modules and tanks and stuff. It's not, not these shiny chrome rockets with fins and everything. You're out of your mind. That's, 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 that's like from the 30s and the 40s. What do I know? For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Woodle. We'll see you next time right here on Right Angle.